He survived the horrors of Iran. I was 17 years old when my dad was killed and was martyred with 26 stabs of knife. But he wasn't expected to recover from a motorcycle accident. They said, Gilbert, that's it. There's no hope. See what doctors are calling miraculous. That was a total surprise. And uh, it, it was unbelievable when we first saw it. Plus, meet the former doctor who was left with a traumatic brain injury and discovered his new normal. All on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Here's Ephraim Graham with this week's Top 5 from Studio 5. At number five. And what I lack, you are full of. Jonathan McReynolds has something new for those who follow him and his music. John. Yeah. What you doing? Read. What you reading? This new book. What new book? Make room. His new book, Make Room, is available this week following the theme of his latest album, also titled Make Room. An excerpt from the book notes, our purpose is tied to what we contribute to the public, but our reward is tied to how we honor him in private. And what I'm doubting, you are sure of, so I'll trust the lover, the lover of my soul. At number four. Been said he has the most beautiful voice in the world, and now for the first time, Andrea Bocelli has hit number one on the Billboard 200 album chart with his new album, C. It features duets with Ed Sheeran, Josh Groban, and more. I thought sooner or later the lights up above will come down in circles and God made a love. That's Bocelli's son, whose voice is also beautiful. Fly like a cannonball straight to my soul. Amos sings this duet, Fall on Me, with his dad on the soundtrack for the new Disney film, The Nutcracker and the Four Realms. With all your life. At number three. Fresh from the Ellen stage, Lauren Daigle graces the latest cover of Relevant Magazine, sharing the story of her rise from a worship leader to one of pop music's most buzzed about artists. Our next guest has been compared to everyone from Adele to Amy Winehouse. Her new CD just debuted at number one. She's amazing, here to perform Still Rolling Stones. Please welcome Lauren Daigle. In this wide-ranging article, Lauren shares, I was trying to find home in a million different places. God has a way of reminding you who you are. If my life was a book, the title would be How to Live Like a Child in an Adult-Proof World. <laughs> On songwriting, Lauren shares, it's giving people a prayer to sing, words in their mouths that were there, but they didn't know how to access. Why should people listen to my music? Because, um, I think the message is one of hope and unity. And right now we're in crazy times in the world and I think that people want to have love to hold on to. They want to have truth to hold on to. They want to be able to sit next to someone and not feel like everyone is a stranger in the world. At number two. Nigerian-born actress, writer, and comedian Yvonne Orji is also on the pages of the latest edition of Relevant Magazine. I remember praying. Honest to God, I prayed and I was like, God, I need a talent. And I, sure as day, I hear do comedy. When asked how her faith plays into her comedy, Orgy shares, it's not like I put it on a coat hanger and then take it out wherever convenient. I don't use profanity in my comedy. I don't do blue humor. And so for me, that's how faith plays in. Are you guys ready for a good show? There it is. At number one. My son is out there somewhere and I don't know what he's doing. Beautiful Boy is described as the heartbreaking and inspiring experience of survival, relapse, and recovery. So how you doing? I'm doing great, you know, just, um, um, just doing what needs to be done. What does that mean? I'm sorry, Dad, um. Why don't we just have lunch and talk? We can do that, right? Mm. 
please. Based on the true story David Chef shares in his book, Beautiful Boy, and his son Nick shares in Tweak, growing up on methamphetamines. I hope this movie ignites an emotional reaction out of people, but I can sell it to myself almost in my head that we're not doing it like self, uh, it's, it's, this is, a, this is something a lot of people are going through. It's in American theaters now. Do you know how much I love you? I love you more than everything. 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 Well, joining me now is Ephraim, and let's talk about Beautiful Boy. It mm. seems to be a very touching film. It is very touching, and if you are going to the theater to see it, take your tissues. Based on a true story, uh, if anyone has been touched by drug addiction or have a family member who's been addicted to drugs, this story uh, really painfully paints it on the big screen for us. The beautiful thing is this son does come out, but you see a father's love for his son. They have a great relationship and something goes wrong. He's a brilliant, talented kid, um, but somehow feels empty uh, and resorts to methamphetamines is on drugs. Um, I have had members of my family addicted to drugs, people who I thought were brilliant and had it all going on and had it all together and watch drugs tear apart their life. And then me being on my knees, praying and praying that God would deliver them and that they would come to themselves. Uh, and no matter how much you try, you realize that there's only so much you can do that they've got to also well, the, taken on. Uh, slogan from recovery mm -hmm. is, if they are not able to control their addiction, you surely can't. Absolutely not. And uh, addiction never makes sense. Not at all. Not at and all. It never makes any kind of sense. At all. No. Viewers said this was this this film was scarier in terms of their story than Halloween. It just shows you mm. uh, how difficult it was. But also, there's a, a beautiful hope. And as you see, both of them wrote books about it. Uh, and I've seen interviews with the dad and his son. Such a great relationship. Such a I've, redemptive story. I haven't seen story. the movie, but do, does it get into how to recover? Uh, a, a little a little bit you really see just how things fall apart uh, more so unknowingly t to the dad is like I didn't see this coming and then the struggle to get him back and you think okay we're here and then there's a relapse mm -hmm. and we go back to where we you know we thought we'd already yeah. fallen from anyone going through recovery relapse is part of recovery absolutely um, and this, this the, the issue is not that you fall the issue is do you get back up amen and if you <laughs> get back up mm -hmm. uh, you'll find there's a lot of help for you absolutely a lot of people cheering for you you got it well lauren daigle mm. she's like gone to superstar <laughs> she she has we saw her at ellen last week well this week she's actually going to be on the tonight show with jimmy fallon uh as well uh she is on tour um, amazing story. I mean, this girl went from being a reject on American Idol to a worship leader uh, and now one of the hottest pop stars there is. Uh, and her music does not stray from the message of hope that she talks about, uh, that God is indeed the source of that hope. Uh, she's on the pages of Relevant Magazine um, this month. Uh, and beautiful story um, of her heart. It's just nice to see. She's a Louisiana girl. Uh, it's it's fun to see even who she follows and who she, who her who she's a fan of in terms of music. I mean, Aretha Franklin, she's very soulful, uh, you name it. But she's a, she's a great one. I really... Oh, I have to confess, I'm a, I'm a fan. Uh, I, good. <laughs> good. Yeah, this, this old guy is a fan. It's like I'm, I'm becoming current again. Yeah, she, she won um, me over too. <laughs> so, I mean, there's something haunting to her voice. It's yes. Really, it's just absolutely beautiful. It just drives right through you. I love and, to listen to um, her. Yeah. And so right, that she talks how do you describe her? Because she's definitely, you know, the industry term crossover. Mm -hmm. She's gone from Christian worship music to the pop charts and winning, you know, all kinds of awards. Absolutely. I mean, she's, she's, she's <laughs> high on the billboard charts. Uh, I, she is, she is almost everything if, if you could be. I mean, she's soulful, she's pop, she's gospel, she's got it all there in that voice. It's, it's, but what does she really mean by living like a child I, then, Now adult? that, I'm not what sure. Is that? I think that was a joke. She just figured, well, what would I title my life? Okay, well, here you go. I'm, I'm thinking, she probably thought, well, weird question. Here's a weird answer. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. Take that and you, you guys figure it out. <laughs> I can't. Like, Me neither. It's an adult-proof world. I don't no. <laughs>
I'm going to quiz her. I'm, hopefully one day I can quiz her. Can Open you invitation. Yes. You want to come on the yes, 7 Yes, we Club? love you. Come on, Interactive, please. <laughs> we want uh, please, you please, for please. sure. All right, Jonathan McReynolds has mm -hmm. some news for his fans. What do you think? It's a, a great book. It's called Make Room. The theme of his latest album is Make Room, and he talks about the fact that we are conditioned and sort of raised to to isolate God and only put him in certain portions of our life. And he's encouraging those who listen to his music and readers alike that no, God wants to actually be a part of every single corner of your life. You've got to just make room for him to be there. The areas that you thought he didn't care about, he's actually truly concerned. And his book's book, uh, I've only read excerpts, but his book is said to give even practical steps for people to to begin making that room and recognizing. And he shares the story of where he's boxed God, God out in his life as well, intentionally sometimes, sometimes unintentionally, not realizing and recognizing. I think most of us do that. We do it. We, and, we, and we can even do it unconsciously. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the conscious part yeah. <laughs> gets, us, gets us into trouble, but mm -hmm. that unconscious can sort of, you know, you just kind of slip away and, uh, you know, you still have your Sunday morning time, yep. all of that, mm -hmm. but... Uh, God, I've got this. Yeah, there are some and years you man, think you guess can what? You don't. <laughs> you don't. No, not at all. And yeah, he's going to let you what. find that out eventually if yeah. you don't really no, realize it. You're, you're going to go off on your own. You're going to, you know, the good news is yes. you can always come home. And get back yeah, up again. That's, that's why we take communion. Amen. Well, for all the latest in entertainment news, check out Ephraim's weekly show, Studio 5. You can watch it online at cbn.com slash Studio 5. And Ephraim, we'll see you next week. See you next week. Well, coming up, he was living the American dream until tragedy struck. Dr. Jeff Huxford shares on finding normal after suffering a severe traumatic brain injury. He's next. Stay with us. Well, Dr. Jeff Huxford was running errands when a truck blew through a red light and sent his car into a cement telephone pole. In an instant, Jeff's life changed forever. Jeff and Jackie Huxford were living the American dream. As an MD, Jeff ran a successful family medical practice until he suffered a traumatic brain injury in a near-fatal car crash. Jeff's recovery amazed doctors, and after only a month in the hospital, he returned home. But something had changed. In his book, Finding Normal, Jeff tells how his tragic accident turned his life into something beautiful. Well, Dr. Jeff, Jeff Huxford is with us, and thanks for being here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you, know, you see the pictures of your accident, and it is absolutely amazing that anyone could walk away. Uh, that you, you see this, and you know, I assume Jaws of Life got you out, and that's why there's no roof right. on, the, on the car, but uh, you don't remember any of it. No, I don't. Um, uh, the morning of the accident, I ran into town to run a few errands, and I remember leaving the hardware store that morning, but that's the last thing I recall from that morning. I don't recall the, the drive home at all. Okay. Yeah. It, it, when you woke up in the hospital, mm -hmm. you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. I assume you knew at that moment, oh, no. I, at first, well, when I, when I woke up, I wasn't really aware of what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, after you have a brain injury, you can have something called post-traumatic amnesia. And that's kind of the period where you really don't know what's going on. You're, you don't know where you are, who you are. And I had that for quite a while. Um, actually, my first recollection after the accident was being, um, I was in a hospital in downtown Chicago that overlooked Lake Michigan. And I remember looking out the window and I was thinking I was on vacation and I was overlooking the ocean. That's actually, my first recollection was thinking that I'm not in the hospital at all. I'm on vacation and uh, uh, that's, that was my first. That's, all so, right. Yeah. So when did it dawn on you, you you've had a brain injury? Yeah. So I would say probably about a week after that first, uh, my first recollection is when I kind of realized that I something had happened, that I had a brain injury, and I don't think I realized how severe it was. Mm -hmm. um, my wife said I would ask questions all the time about what happened, and uh, she would tell me, and like an hour later I would ask her the yeah, same question. What happened? Yeah. Same. Yeah, you um, had no recollection. Right. So I, I don't. I knew I had a brain injury and it was pretty severe, but I don't think I realized. Uh, how bad it was, um, you know. They told me early on that uh, after a brain injury, you gotta, you're gonna be a different person. Mm -hmm. uh, you gotta find what they call a new normal, and 
uh, I kind of I didn't want to believe them, but I didn't want to believe them as far as that goes. I wanted to uh, kind of be the anomaly or the exception of the rule. And yeah, I'd you be, wanted to recover fast. Yeah, I'd be, and, I'd be able to, and, I'd be able to get super yes, hero right. And, I'd be able and to get back. actually, you did that. Yeah, and that's the thing. Um, that proved to be that was like proven to be proven to be something I could do uh, early on. Um, mm -hmm. When they said, you know, they said early on that. My chances of returning to be a doctor were low, and uh, if it did, it would take a long time. But after just five months, I returned to practicing medicine, albeit at a much lower, at a much uh, smaller but scale. But that's still incredible. Yeah, but still, yeah. So when that happened, I was just thinking, you know, I got this. I'm going to get this. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to keep getting better and better, and I'm going to get back to this normal that they said I couldn't have. Uh, my mother had a stroke, and okay. in the aftermath, uh, her comment that really just lingers with me, I feel like I've lost part of myself. Yeah. Is that how you felt? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I think uh, I feel I feel that way. I feel like I've I've lost a lot. And um, when I start folk, when I when that's my perspective on it, if I start focusing on things I've lost, that can mm -hmm. get get me down and get me it's depressed. Really depressed. But um, just switching my perspective on okay, I've lost many things, but what have I gained? Because you know, uh, some good things have happened as a result of this this tragedy. If I can continue to focus on those things, um, you you actually have tried to develop the attitude of the traumatic brain injury is a gift. Yeah. Why? Why um, is that? Well, so many people, well, I, get, I get this question a lot because they'll see what I'm doing now and they'll ask me, if you had to do it over again, would you, would you do it again? You know, you uh, had this traumatic brain injury, but some, so many, so many things, so much, so much good things, so many good things have happened since then. Would you do it again? And my answer really is that, you know, um, I would never want to go through this again. Mm -hmm. It's been it's been a, a terrible thing, but yeah, I'm not um, going to run errands. Right? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah, right. do that one again. Yeah, no more. Yeah. Um, but if if this is what it took for me to um, uh, grow spiritually and grow in my faith, this is what God's plan was for my life. Then um, then uh, I would accept that because um, my uh, my faith has grown tremendously since this since this thing since this accident occurred. Uh, why is that? I, I've, I've actually witnessed that in my mother where, mm -hmm. okay, the grief, I've lost part of myself, but right. now every day she's looking, well, what can I do now? Right. What can I do and how can I move forward? Right. Uh, she's back leading Bible studies mm -hmm. again, which I never thought she'd do, and uh, she's really into it. Yeah. Uh, it, why is that? What, what, what's your experience with it's that? Been, it's been a process. It's ongoing. It's still, I mean, I'm still growing today. If I, if I ever get to the point where I think I don't need to grow anymore, I think I'm in a, a bad position. But I think part of it was, um, again, after the accident, I wanted to work hard and get back what I had. And eventually I realized that wasn't going to happen. I kind of had to give up. And so um, uh, you, people, people give up on something. They think that was as a negative thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to give up. It means you failed. But I think when I finally uh, was able to give up and stop trying to get back what I was, um, I was able to kind of, uh, uh, if you go back to my faith, I was always trying to work hard and check boxes off. And it wasn't about the relationship with Jesus. It was more about uh, doing, 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 doing the right thing. And uh, when I was finally gave up on the brain injury, I was able to give up on doing enough for God and realize that I need to surrender myself to him, surrender myself to what Jesus has already done for me. And, uh, Stop, yeah. stop working so hard and get off the it. treadmill yes, and, and trust just, and trust 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 in what he's already done what's yeah. next for you um uh well i read, I read this I read this book and the book just came out yesterday um on november 6th so uh i'm excited to see how that goes uh to see uh if that can help other people and if that's why i wrote the book to tell my story and hopefully people can uh, relate to my story even if they ha haven't had a brain injury if they've had some sort of a tra uh, traumatic experience or dramatic life change, uh, they can read the story and uh, see that God's always there. And he's, uh, when your life is messy, when your life uh, appears like uh, a complete disaster, that God is uh, in that story and he's working it for good. So I'm hoping that... Um, and he's still there. Say, yeah, and he's still exactly, with you. Exactly. He's uh, redeeming, he can redeem your story no matter... Uh, no matter how low you get. All right, Jeff, yeah. thanks for being with us. If you want to learn more about Jeff's story, his book is called Finding Normal. It's available wherever books are sold. I encourage you to get it. Uh, maybe you haven't had a traumatic injury, but you may know someone who has, and this will help you walk with them through that journey. And so, Jeff, thanks for the story. Yeah. Thank you. Well, still ahead, a wife receives devastating news from her husband's doctor. They said, Gilbert, that's it. There's no hope. 
But those doctors didn't count on one thing. See what they're calling miraculous when we come back. Well, Gilbert has more pages in his medical records than most books. In there, the doctors wrote no guarantees of a good outcome. Gilbert needed a series of miracles to live. The first, making it to the hospital alive. I waited and I waited, several hours went by. First I texted him, and then I start calling him, no answers, and this is very unusual for Gilbert. Ani Husepian finally did get a call that December evening in 2014. Her husband Gilbert had been in a motorcycle accident and was being flown to Huntington Hospital in Pasadena, California. Ani was given few details, so she prayed it wasn't serious. At the hospital, the head doctor told her otherwise. And I thought he would say, oh, go in and, you know, visit him. But he said, oh, you need to go in and say your goodbye. <laughs> I said, Lord, I surrender. You'd need to take over. Gilbert had veered off the road and crashed head first into a mountainside. Along with multiple broken bones, he had massive brain trauma and wasn't expected to live. But family and friends who gathered to pray believed differently. And I pray, Father God, that the physicians. I was just praying in my heart that Lord, you, you see everything and you know what's ahead. Um, so honestly, if I didn't have my faith, I don't know what would I, you know, it would be impossible. Over the course of the night, the prognosis changed. They said, well, it looks like he's surviving, but he will be paralyzed from neck down. Two days later, Gilbert woke up and tests confirmed he wasn't paralyzed. But it wasn't over. He had to overcome a bout with memory loss and still faced a multitude of surgeries and months of physical therapy. Even then, doctors expected he could be permanently disabled. We kept pushing through and praying, and then it was constant, uh, you know, pray, take a step forward, pray, take a step forward. Gilbert was fully aware of what was at stake, but he still trusted God. I knew that God is going to show up. God is going to change things. God is there with me. That's because this wasn't the first time God carried his family through difficult trials. While living in Iran, they were persecuted for their faith. I was 17 years old when my dad was killed and was martyred with 26 stabs of knife. Was it easy? No. Was his grace enough? Yes, his grace was enough even then. After a year of surgeries and physical therapy, only one thing hadn't been fully restored. The fingers on his right hand were locked closed because of nerve damage. Of all the possible outcomes, this troubled Gilbert the most. He felt his purpose and passion was leading others and worshiping God through his talent as a pianist. They said, Gilbert, that's it. There's no hope. And this is my, my situation. I, I mean, this was, I couldn't move my fingers and I couldn't even shake hands. The physician in charge of Gilbert's physical therapy, Dr. Rafi Balian. He could not use his hands to, to play because that was his profession, as you know. Uh, so that was a limitation that we thought would be devastating for him because that was the end of a career almost. Still, Gilbert pressed on and managed to get one finger to work. It was extremely hard, but again, I knew that God is good. I can't see God's goodness in this area right now, but God is good. While Gilbert came to terms with his disability, he and his family continued to fast and pray for complete healing. Almost seven months after the surgery, I went to France to share the gospel and share my testimony, actually. This couple came up to me. They said, we are led by the Holy Spirit to pray for your healing. 
That couple, they prayed over my hand, my fingers. I received that word by faith, even though, again, I had my doubts, but praise the Lord, His grace is even beyond and above our faith and understanding. The next morning, I woke up, and when I woke up, my fingers opened up. It was, I couldn't even believe that this is happening. And when I came to Los Angeles, where I live, I went to EMG test, the nerve test, and the doctor said, wow, interesting, your nerves are regenerating. That was a total surprise, and uh, it, it was unbelievable when we first saw it. I know, nothing can uh, change my mind or reassure me that it was anything other than a miracle. His faith, his uh, determination played a major role in his overall recovery. Exceptional is, is probably the right word. It's amazing also, and I think we can also use the word miraculous for this kind of recovery. Gilbert is still using his gift through his family ministry, helping people in the Farsi-speaking world worship God. I knew my purpose, very clear. My purpose in life is to know him and to make him known. And through this accident, I got to know him much more. Praise the Lord. My purpose is to know him and make him known. And in that knowledge, here's what he said. I knew God was good. I knew God would show up. So he's going around his purpose. I'm, I'm here to show him, know him, and make him known. She go, he goes on a trip to France, and then the miraculous happens. A couple comes up, we're led by the Holy Spirit to pray for your full recovery. What the doctors say can never happen. Nerves don't regenerate. Nerves regenerated. A miracle happened. An extraordinary recovery. Now what can happen to you? All you have to do is believe that God is good. And then you know that He will show up. If you want someone to pray with you today, regardless of what, you, what the doctors say or what you need, we're here for you. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000, to say, I need prayer. Here's a word from Matthew chapter 19. Jesus looked at them and said, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. 